Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when something happens in someone's life that is meaningful and important, they want to take that news and share it with others. Think about it. When two people who love each other want to take the next step in their relationship, they get engaged. And as soon as they do that, they want to tell people about it. They tell their family and friends about the big news. And with today's technology, that can happen almost instantaneously. The newly engaged couple wants to tell everyone about their news. They'll tell first their family and friends, but soon they just start telling everyone because they're so excited. They tell the mailman, the pizza delivery guy, some guy they see walking on the street. They want to tell everyone about this. Why? Because it's such meaningful and important news to them. Well, in our text for today, we see that John the Baptist had some meaningful and important news to share as well. But this news wasn't about two people who were going to spend the rest of their lives together. No, this news was about everyone. This news was for you and for me. And this was the greatest news that the world had ever seen. This news said that Jesus was the Lamb of God sent to take away the sins of the entire world. So today, as we look at that Lamb to whom John points us, we want to learn all about Him. We want to know everything there is to know about this Lamb. And then once we learn about Him, we want to take that knowledge and share it with others. The very first verse of our text we look at is one of the most important verses in the Bible. We read, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John calls Jesus a Lamb. Now the meaning behind being called a Lamb goes way back to the Old Testament times. In Exodus chapter 12, we see the Passover Lamb. This is the time when Israel was held captive under Egypt, but Moses kept coming to Pharaoh again and again, telling him to let God's people go. But, again and again, Pharaoh refused. So God brought plague after plague to him, demonstrating his power, saying that, if you want these plagues to stop, just let my people go. But Pharaoh would never do that. So finally, with the tenth and final plague, God would make Pharaoh let his people go. In this plague, the, a lamb was sacrificed, and the blood was put on the sides and the top of the door frames. So when this happened, when the Lord would come, he would pass over the house that had this blood because it was a sign that these people belonged to God. The land that was chosen for this had some specific qualifications that it had to be. First of all, it had to be a year old lamb, a male, and without any blemish or defect. Each year after this, the Israelites were to commemorate this by slaughtering the lamb and using it for the Passover feast. And another account we see in we see lambs used for the consecration of the priests. Every day they were to sacrifice two lambs, one in the morning and one at twilight. They did this for the purification of their sins. Later in Leviticus, we see all the different rules and regulations that God demands of his people for their offerings. Often in these offerings, a lamb without blemish or defect was used in the sacrifice. Finally, we see in Isaiah a foreshadowing of the work of our Savior. Isaiah says in 53, chapter 7, He was held, or he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Jesus is just like these Old Testament lambs. But there's a little bit of difference. First of all, the Old Testament lambs were sacrificed again and again and again. Jesus' sacrifice, however, was a one time sacrifice. It was one and done. It was the ultimate sacrifice because it was the last one. Nothing else needs to be done because Jesus' death atones for everything. Second of all, these lambs of the Old Testament were used specifically in the sin offerings and the grain offerings to atone and cleanse for Israel's sin. Jesus is necessary for the atonement and cleansing of sin as well. But not only for Israel, but for the entire world. And finally, these lambs were just lambs. I mean, they didn't willingly sacrifice themselves. It's not like one of the lambs stepped up from the herd and said, Don't worry, I got this one. It didn't happen like that. However, Jesus knew what he was doing. Jesus knew that he was going to face imminent death. 
Yet, he still willingly let himself be sacrificed in our place, even though he knew he was going to die. This willing sacrifice is kind of like in The Hunger Games. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with The Hunger Games. It was a book that was recently turned into a movie. In this book, all these, there's 12 districts, and they all have to pick a representative, both a male and a female, who will participate in the games for that year. But this isn't the type of game that you want to participate in. This is a game that's a battle to the death. So out of these 24 participants, there's only one survivor. Each of the 12 districts has to go through this every year. In District 12, Primrose Everdeen's name is called to be this year's female representative. But Primrose is just a little girl, and she would never stand a chance of survival. So, her older sister, Katniss Everdeen, steps up and she says, I volunteer. I volunteer as tribute. You see, Katniss stepped in her sister's place. That's what Jesus does for us. Jesus steps in our place. But this isn't just a sacrifice for one person like it was Katniss and Primrose. This is a sacrifice for everyone. And this isn't just uh, a one-time thing in a, in a made-up event, in a made-up book. This is real life, and this counts for all time. But in order to fully understand what it truly means for Jesus willingly volunteering to be our sacrificial man and taking away the sins of the world, we first need to understand the severity of sin. Everybody sins. Every single one of us has sinned. There's nothing we can do about that. None of us has, has refrained from sinning ever since we were born. That's the way it is. We're all in this together. And since we're in this together, I can tell you the brutal consequences that we have to face for us. That is death and eternal damnation. Now, as bad as that sounds, that's not even the worst part. The worst part is we can't do anything about it. It's not like we can somehow make up for it or, or write a check to God. We can't make up for our sins. So when we... When we're lost and condemned like this, we think of sin in either one of two ways. Either we think that our sin is so bad and it's poisoned us so much that we can't deal with the consequences, so we chalk it up as it's not real. There aren't really any consequences. We're fine just the way we are. Or we look at it the other way, the complete opposite way, that we're so bad in our sinfulness, we know everything we've done wrong, all the, all the secret sins we do, everything that we hide, that even Jesus can't take away our sins. Well, either way of looking at this would be 100% wrong. We are sinful. But Jesus can take away our sins. And he did take away our sins. John rightfully called Jesus the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. He calls him this Lamb because when he was here on earth, when he was flesh and blood just like we were, he acted like a sacrificial lamb. He met God's demand of perfection. Jesus was without any blemish or defect. And he willingly let himself be led to slaughter, led to be sacrificed in our place. So that when he died on the cross, he paid the punishment for our sins. He took away all our sins when he was bloodied and bruised and beaten in our place. By his wounds, we have been healed. Like all the lambs of the Old Testament who were led to slaughter to atone for the sins of Israel, Jesus is our lamb who was slaughtered to atone for our sins. That is why we want to learn about Jesus. When we learn about Jesus, we see that he was sent to be our substitute and, and our sacrificial lamb in our stead. He was here to take away everyone's sins. Since that information is so important and meaningful, we want to learn everything we can about it and then tell it to others. We want to share it with others so they know the love of their Savior too. In our text, in John's testimony, he has this to say about the Lamb of God. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin because Mary and Elizabeth were cousins. So when John says that he didn't know him, this isn't saying that John didn't physically know who Jesus was. John knew Jesus as his cousin, but... He didn't know that Jesus would be the one on whom the Holy Spirit would remain. But God the Father revealed that to him. Our text says, And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water, that's God the Father, told me, 
The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. God the Father was the one who sent John ahead of Jesus to do what he was doing at this very moment, to reveal Jesus as the Lamb. And John dedicated his life to doing this. His whole life was one that was preparing the way for the Lord. And here at this very moment, we see him point to our Savior and say, Look, the Lamb of God. This, this revelation of Jesus' purpose was God's plan all along. He was to be revealed not only to Israel, but for everyone. Our first lesson makes this clear. Our first lesson revealed a prophecy about a Savior who is for all people. Isaiah writes, It's not enough for you to be my servant, raising up the tribes of Jacob, and restoring the protected ones of Israel. I will also make you a light for the nations, to be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Here we see that Jesus, the promised Savior from long ago, the Lamb of God, isn't only for Israel, but for everyone. The same thought is seen in the second lesson where Paul and Barnabas, they, they go out and first to, pre to preach to the Jews. They go there and they tell them this saving message. But God doesn't only want them to hear. He wants all people to hear. So after they told the Jews, they went out and they preached the same message of this salvation that Jesus won for us to the non-Jews, to the Gentiles. That means that this message is for you and me as well. So whenever we're, we're down in our sinfulness and it tries to, to drag us down, and it tells us that there's nothing we can do about our sins, that, that we're too lost in them, that even Jesus can't save us. We can look at Scripture and we can see that that is just a lie that Satan tells us. It's not true. Scripture tells us Jesus takes away everyone's sins. Jesus can save us. And he did save us. Jesus' purpose of, of being our Savior, being the Lamb of God, was revealed to John so he could reveal it to other people. One of the people to whom John revealed this important message was one of his own disciples, Andrew. And then once Andrew heard this message, the very first thing that he did was tell his brother about it. Andrew said,